A few verses in Luke 6, verse 12, where we left off. You know what? Before we get to verse 12, let's go to verse 11. I want to see something there. It says, but they themselves, the religious leadership, were filled with rage and discussed together how that what they might do to Jesus. We learn from Matthew, it says how they might destroy him or in some versions, kill him. And then it says the next verse, remember, there's no chapter or verse breaks in the original language. It says, and at this time, it was at this time, then he went off to a mountain to pray. I bet he did. (laughs) That was good timing on his part. He said, you know, they're wanting to kill me. Now's the time to go get refueled. Now, we also know there are times that they wanted to push him off a cliff or kill him or stone him or, you know, do all these things. He walked right between them because he was still in authority over all those issues that he faced. Says he went at this time. To off to a mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And we're going to come back to that in more detail and look at that. Because if you're reading this, if it's been a while since you've read that verse, or maybe it's your first time reading it, you read that and you say, that's kind of odd. This is God in the flesh going to pray all night. And when day came, he called his disciples to him, and he chose 12 of them, whom he also named as apostles. We'll look at that as well. Simon, whom he also named Peter and Andrew, his brother and James and John and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon, who was called the zealot, Judas, the son of James and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Judas Iscariot, we know that name. And we see something here, um, again, that we'll come back to here in a little bit, that is very odd. God is praying to God. And uh, it, it says, in, you know, it came up to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray. What I want to do is first look at the disciples, and then we're going to circle back and look at this time that he spent in seeking wisdom as far as who he would choose. So let's look at these disciples. Open up to Matthew's account in Matthew 10. It says, And having summoned his twelve disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And again, we see a little more detail there uh, about them. Now, that, and then it gives the names of the disciples. It says, these 12, Jesus sent out after instructing them, saying, verse 5, do not go in the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter any of the city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you received, freely give. Do not acquire gold or silver, copper for your money or your bag or a bag for your journey or even two tunics or sandals or a staff for the worker is worthy of his support. In whatever city or village you enter, inquire who is worthy in it and abide there until you go away. And as you enter the house, give it your greeting and the house is worthy. Let your greeting of peace be upon it. If it's not worthy, let your greeting of peace return to you. Whoever does not receive you nor heed your words as you go out of that house or that city, shake off the dust from your feet. Truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So we see a lot more information, and it continues actually through the end of, all the way through uh, the end of chapter 10, uh, more detail as far as what he was giving them and telling them to look and to, to expect around the corner. But we see a couple of things here. We see them call, he says, he called his disciples and he picked 12 apostles. And so uh, I want to look at those two things first. First of all, it's the, the call, there's the calling to the ministry and, and the called of the ministry. He's ca- they're called to be with him. It says, it says that he called them and they would be with him. And they weren't always with him. They were sent out by twos, right? But he was always with them in his power. And so um, disciple means a learner or a pupil or a student, right? An apostle is someone who is sent. It's uh, literally a messenger, someone who has a message and is sent out with a specific message, a delegate, one sent forth to deliver orders and carry out their orders. 
but he also, it also says he was, they were given power to accomplish their mission. So the one who calls us will equip us to do what we're called to do. God always empowers us to do what he's called us to do. He empowered them. He empowers us. God's not going to call you to do something and not give you the strength to do it. It's not about you. It wasn't about you when you got saved. It wasn't about me. It, was, it wasn't about us. It was about him when we got saved. And it's about him with every moment and everything he calls us to do. So it's the, applying that same faith. So let's look at the names of these individuals. Verse 2 in chapter 10 of Matthew. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. The first Simon, who is called Peter. Simon is a Jewish name, uh, but Jesus called him Petros. That's a, a piece of rock. In English, we would call him Rocky, perhaps, you know, say, hey, there's Rocky. And um, there is a misunderstanding uh, with, with Peter and uh, the Catholic Church. They say that um, Peter was the first pope. Uh, Peter was because Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. He was talking about a different rock. Uh, for example, Peter, he said, he's, you're the stone. And he says, upon this rock, meaning like a mountain, pointing to himself, Jesus, we imagine he did. This rock, I'll build my church. Jesus is the rock upon whom we, the church is built, not Peter. But Peter definitely um, was not very solid. <laughs> Even it's ironic. And maybe Jesus was just kind of saying, hey, Peter, you're going to do great things. So when you fail <laughs> and you deny me three times, you know, that you even know me, just hang in there because you're still going to do great things. And uh, it's, it's just you know, we would see it as irony. Maybe the Lord sees it. We see the Lord's calling him Peter, calling him Rocky because, hey, you're going to be solid. I see it in you. He knows tomorrow, right? And so he already sees what he's going to be. He's saying he sees great potential in him. And that's what he does to us too. He calls us and we may not see great things in ourselves, but he says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. It's about who lives in your heart and is operating through you, you yielding to his power. And so I believe it's the same for Peter as it is for us. And then he says, Andrew, his brother, and Andrew just means manly. So you've got Rocky and manly man. Okay. So keep that in mind. We'll come back to it. And then you got James and John. Later we see James and John, Jesus called them the sons of thunder. They were fiery. They, they at one point wanted to call down fire from heaven on a village that rejected them. And Jesus was like, lighten up <laughs> just a little bit. You need to just chill, you know. But the sons of thunder, he called them because they were just, they were always on fire and, and ready to, to just, uh, you know, bring it. Philip uh, means fond of horses. Not very, not much there. Bartholomew, son of a plowman. You son of a plowman. Maybe he called him that every once in a while. Maybe that was derogatory in his day. I don't know. But uh, that's, that's what it means, uh, his Jewish name. Thomas, personal name from Hebrew, meaning a twin. And we, we also see Didymus in the Greek. You may have that in your, in your Bible and other places. He was born um, Levi, but Jesus called him Matthew. We know that Matthew, and over here it says uh, that um, it says he called uh, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, and Matthew. Now, we know his name is Levi, but I really like that Matthew here in the book of Matthew that God inspired him to write calls himself Matthew. You know what Matthew means? Gift of God. And so, um, you know, maybe sometimes someone may criticize Matthew and say, you think you're the gift of God to, to humanity? And so, yes, actually, I am the gift of God. <laughs> it's, it's my name. So, but but it's, I, I, it makes sense why Matthew called himself that from then on. He chose to live in the moment rather than in the past. He knew that he was hated by his Jewish neighbors. He knew that he, he had partnered up with the Romans to make himself very wealthy. We looked at that already. And um, it's, it's, it's like he's, he's saying, I'm, I'm latching on to what God sees in me. I'm going to hold on to what the Lord sees. And I think that's a good word for us too, that uh, he doesn't say, you know, Levi's dead and gone. That's what he says. He says, Levi's dead and gone, but Matthew, that's, that's who I am now. Instead of regretting the past, um, and just holding on to that and just beating himself up for it. He says, that life's gone. The Lord sees me as a gift. And he's given me a gift. And, and whatever he, you know, meditated on that 
uh, obviously affected his life and ministry greatly. James, James the Less, um, you know, it, it's, it's, that's his name, James the Less, and, and that's what he was, was called. J uh, Simon the Zealot. The Zealots were a fanatical Jewish nationalistic political sect. They were the rebels. They were the ones in the society among the Romans who wanted to overthrow the Romans covertly. They would walk around with their uh, dagger hidden in their cloak. And upon the signal or the wink or the, the, the whatever signal they got from someone who said, hey, that's get that Roman soldier, they would, they would uh, covertly and maybe assassinate even not just soldiers, but those who were higher, more higher politically. And Simon the Zealot was, um, was one of Jesus' disciples. <laughs> Think about Jesus' disciples, maybe our Sunday school understanding of Jesus' apostles uh, and how just all these, you know, peace-loving, which they were peace-loving, uh, but they were Roman-hating. And, and Simon the Zealot definitely had that uh, passion about him uh, when he was called. And I just, I wonder, did he continue that job after he was called uh, by the Lord? Uh, or did he put that hatred of the foreign invader and occupiers uh, aside for his um, time following Jesus? And then Thaddeus, uh, also Judas. Judas was a very common name. So the last two names in the list are Judas and Judas. Uh, but Ju one of them goes by Thaddeus in some translations as well. Thaddeus or Judas, the son of James, not Iscariot, um, and his, his name Thaddeus means large hearted or courageous. And so uh, we see his, um, what the Lord saw in him, uh, even lining up with his name. And then Judas Iscariot. And Judas Iscariot um, was chosen by Jesus. And yet Jesus, as God, knew everything. He knew who was going to betray him. Um, again, we'll come back to that as well. So you see, you've got uh, the, this, this motley crew, and in the world's perspective, not really a group of people who were um, qualified. <laughs> they didn't have degrees. They didn't have the, the letters after their name, um, but they had Jesus calling on their life. And that's all they needed, and that's all any of us need. The Lord doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And, and when he calls us, it's his power, his strength, his wisdom, his love, his peace, his grace that flows through us into the world around us. So Jesus tw chose 12 very ordinary men, very common, nothing extraordinary about them. And God chose us too. And he uses the ones then and now, although ordinary, who simply say yes to him, who yield to him. When he moves, when he compels, when he arranges circumstances in such a way, and we say, okay, Lord, I see what you're doing here. Yes, I'm yours. Do what you want through me and in my life. Here's the thing. I don't want to see any of us live our lives and come to the end of our lives, never knowing the joy of your calling and your purpose. I want all of us to know what that is and to know the wonderful freedom and joy and satisfaction that comes from saying, okay, God, yes, I'm tired of fighting against your will. Have your will in me. The Lord's prayer, part of the Lord's prayer says, your will be done, right? And that's something that is good to keep in mind daily. Lord, your will be done, not mine. Your will be done on earth. Your will be done in my family, in my work, in me, as it is in heaven. And so, just want to point that out when we look at these, these individuals, this uh, group that, that Jesus brought together. Um, and uh, one more thing about them uh, that may uh, encourage us. And that is that, uh, and, and maybe it's just a further understanding of, of a conversation. So we see, uh, again, we've got Rocky, we've got Manly, we've got the Sons of Thunder, 
So we got, we got a, some tough guys. We got Simon the Zealot and the crew. And then uh, fast forward to right before Jesus offered himself up for our sins. And they were all sitting around sharing a meal, right? Having the Lord's Supper. And uh, Jesus told Judas Iscariot, what you do, you remember? Do quickly. Go ahead and do that. And so some sources would say, okay, well, what he was saying was go ahead and get it over with. But when you look at the crew around the table, (laughs) the dagger tucked away in the cloak and all that, he may have been saying, you know what? You need to go ahead and get out of here because if they have any word of what you're about to do, you're going to be dead. (laughs) And that's possibly what he was saying to them. And again, some sources actually say that 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 was probably what he was getting at was what you do, do quickly because you don't want them to find out. And Jesus wanted him, of course, to go ahead and do that because it was lining up exactly according to prophecy and according to what God had ordained to happen. So, um, so that's, that's the 12 apostles, very ordinary, very common, nothing extraordinary about them. And maybe that's a word for us. Maybe that each of us can look at ourselves and maybe we've not taken that next step with the Lord and whatever he's leading and compelling us to walk in because we thought, well, I'm nothing special. Yeah. Well, that's exactly who God uses. He uses throughout time, the very ordinary in this world. So I want to go back to that, um, that place that we saw in Luke, that verse, verse 12, he goes off up to the mountain to pray and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. Jesus was at this critical point in his ministry. He was at this place where he was um, really needing to get some things in place before he left. And he only had a few years of public ministry, as we know. He had already offended the traditions of the religious leadership, and he would continue to do that. They began to plot his death. We saw that today. They're already scheming. Another thing, the political leadership also um, had been kind of planting seeds among the crowds about how bad he was in their minds, right? Great crowds followed him, but they were not interested in spiritual things. And they could quickly be turned against Jesus, as we saw in his mock trial with Pilate. So in response to these pressures and changing situations, Jesus secludes himself for this time of special, devoted prayer. We suppose that Jesus prayed constantly. I mean, I I would assume that, right? And he, he very well could have. But... For this particular need, he went out to the mountain, to a secluded place, to pray. Spurgeon says, Jesus, therefore, to prevent an eruption, to give himself the opportunity of pouring out his soul, and to avoid being outcast and showing off, whichever, both, both, both uh, scenarios, he sought the mountain, it says. He wanted to go there. So then being alone on the mountain, Jesus continued all night in prayer before choosing the 12 disciples who would become his apostles. Jesus was about to choose these 12. And in one sense, there was nothing in Jesus' three years of ministry before the cross more important than this. These were the men who would carry on what he had done. And without them, the work of Jesus would never extend to the whole world. No wonder Jesus gave this critical choice an entire night of prayer. But wait a minute. I thought Jesus is God. Why does he need to pray? Well, Jesus is God. Yet, he did not simply use his infinite knowledge to pick the apostles. Instead, he prayed all night. So like every other struggle that Jesus faced, he faced this one as man, the man Jesus, the son of man. 
a man who needed to seek the will of his father and rely on the power of the Holy Spirit, just as we do. He is our prototype. He is our role model. We read that Jesus prayed all night. Again, Spurgeon says, one night alone in prayer might make us new men, changed from poverty of soul to spiritual wealth, from trembling to triumphing. A disciple was a learner, a student. But in the first century, a student did not simply study a subject. He followed a teacher. There's an element of personal attachment in disciple that is lacking in student. A student's just someone who's learning. A disciple is someone who follows very closely. Again, the first century, you would see the rabbi walking around and the students very close, the disciples following very close behind them, wanting to hear everything they said. So he chooses these 12 as a foundation for the new chosen people. As Israel had 12 tribes, Jesus would also have 12 apostles. And we see in the holy city in revelation we see the names of the apostles taking a very special place in the new jerusalem so whom he had named apostles it says from among the group of his followers the larger group of disciples he picks 12 apostles ambassador someone who's sent You've heard in our culture, someone may say, I'm apostle so-and-so. Maybe they introduce themselves that way. Have you ever heard that? If that's, that's sometimes in certain churches, you'll hear someone say, I'm apostle so-and-so. And what they're saying there is they are someone who has been sent specifically by God. They've heard from God, they've met God, and they have been called by him. Paul is called an apostle, but Paul didn't see uh, Jesus while he was walking among them face to face and get called by him. But he did have that encounter on that road to Damascus and Jesus called him. So the difference between a disciple and apostle is the disciple is a student, a learner following close behind. The apostle is all those things plus has had that encounter with the Lord and has been called out and sent on that specific mission. And then he calls them, and like we looked at, all their, um, their um, different characteristics, and he knew exactly who he was calling. And I look at, again at that crew. I look at their, their characteristics. I look at, you read the Gospels, and you see some of the boneheaded things they did. Sometimes they were the apostles. Sometimes they acted more like the disciples, right? They were just, you know, they, they, they uh, proved that uh, they're no different from us. Yet, look at the honor bestowed on them. So there's some interesting connections, too, within this group. There are brothers, James and John, Peter and Andrew. There are business associates, Peter, James, and John. They're all fishermen. There are opposing political viewpoints, Matthew, the Roman friendly tax ga gatherer, and then Simon, the Roman hating zealot, and one who would betray Jesus, Judas Iscariot. And then Judas was also Thaddeus, who went out as his partner in ministry. So they go out in pairs for accountability and um, just for encouragement to keep each other encouraged. So I want us to go back to verse 12 again and look at this. Because I mentioned he's our prototype, he's our role model, he is our savior, but he didn't face this very, very important decision as God. He had all the divine power accessible to him. Yet he said, I want to teach us here today. He wanted to teach his disciples. He wanted to teach the believers throughout time. He's the one who modeled that same dependency that we are to have on the wisdom and power of the Father. Jesus himself needed to go pray for a really long time. And it's not just this time. It was frequently that he would go alone by himself to pray. 
and he would go and seek strength and wisdom from the Father. As God, he could have drawn the disciples, those 12, by his power just to miraculously come to him and just to show up at his door and say, here we are. (laughs) They just happened to show up at Jesus' doorstep one day at the exact same time because by his power, he could, could he have done that? He could have done that, right? They introduce themselves to each other. They get acquainted. Hey, yeah, I saw you at the fish, you know, the business associates, the three of them come together, Peter, James, and John. And, you know, maybe a couple of the brothers come together. The others, you know, Matthew and, and Simon, the, or the, the zealot, they come together. And that would be awkward. But they all come together at the same exact time, start hanging out together, get acquainted. Jesus walks out and says, hey, guys. Well, you all know why you're here because I already told you by my power why you're here. I spoke that still small voice, maybe even spoke an audible voice to them and told them what they're to do and what their mission's going to be. So let's get started, guys. Here we go. But if he had done something like that, he could have. Where would that have left them? Where would that have left them in their experience with him? They would never have known the joy of hearing his voice when he first approached them. They would never have known the freedom that came to them when they chose to leave everything to follow him. They would never have felt that burning in their souls that compelled them to drop everything and follow this itinerant preacher. And just the joy and the, the, that came through that surrender to him. No, Jesus lived his entire earthly life as a man who needed to seek the will of his Father and rely on the power of the Holy Spirit just as we do. Because had he not, where would that leave us? We wouldn't have a role model. We wouldn't have. We would say, well, of course he did that. He was, he was God. Yes, he was. He could have done many things with that divine power. But because of his love for us and his all infinite wisdom, he chose to be dependent on the Father. Why? So we would be inspired to live our entire earthly lives as a people who need to seek the will of our Father and rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. Maybe this illustration will help. Um, Can I get a hold of this truth? As April and I are training our children, we have a choice to make every single day. Do we do everything for them? Or do we show them how to do it and let them do it, even letting them make mistakes along the way so they will learn? I'm not going to take a poll from the children, but they would agree. It's the latter. We show them, we demonstrate, and they do it and we step back and even if they make mistakes that's okay because they're learning right but if we were always doing for them things for them that would be weird so as as the teenager teenagers among us would sit down we spoon feed them okay okay, here's your next bite here comes the juju train here it comes that would be weird or helping them get dressed. Hey, hey, uh, I got your clothes picked out for you. Now, sometimes we do that on Sundays, but other days, <laughs> I got your clothes. Come on, let's, let's help you. Come on, let's put one leg in, one leg out. Okay, let me button it up for you. Just kind of, kind of strange. Maybe even riding their bikes for them. Okay, I'm going to show you how to ride your bike and then just keep on riding it for them. But I want to ride the bike and then they're never going to get hurt if I'm riding it for them, right? I can make sure they don't get, don't skin a knee. And those, those illustrations seem a bit silly or absurd, but that's what it would be like had the Lord come to earth and not surrendered and really just kind of yielded his divine power to being 100% man among us, dependent on the Father. So which is more loving, which is more right? in the illustration I gave, which would be more loving for us to say, okay, I'm going to show you how to ride the bike. I'm going to let you practice. Then you're going to fall a couple of times, but don't worry. You're going to be all right. 
show them how to eat, show them how to live, to function, to cook in some cases, to clean, you know, to play, but then to let them go. And Jesus came and he lived as man so that we would know, Lord, I need you. I, I, I need wisdom, strength, power, peace, comfort, all those things that only you can give. And yet Jesus lived dependent on the Father, and yet we so often don't depend on the Father. We, we actually face those tough situations without prayer, those big decisions without intercession, without going to the prayer closet and praying through those things. If he needed it, how much more do we? He is our role model. Here's the thing. You and I are made in the image of God. And because of this, we understand God better than we may think. He shows us the way and the truth so that we may experience his life. And yes, he even lets us make mistakes along the way so that we will learn. And it's even through the mistakes that we see his grace, his power, and we experience his presence. So following the example of our role model by having a consistent dependence on prayer is one of the best ways we can experience God in our lives. Back to Matthew. If y'all will turn back there and we'll wrap up with this thought. Matthew 10, verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them, saying, Do not go in the way of the Gentiles, do not enter the city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why did he say that? Because he said, the Samaritans are going to, we're going to reach the Samaritans. But right now, I want you to go to the people who've heard about you. The ones who, who, who uh, are not been, have not been outcast. We're going to go to the outcast. But for now, first, I want you to go to the lost sheep. Okay. As you go, preach saying this. Y'all look at this, underline it if you don't have it underlined. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That doesn't seem to be too earth shattering. But the point that is often missed is that they're told to show up and God does the rest. The kingdom of this world doesn't understand the kingdom of heaven. Would you agree? They don't understand. The kingdom of God, Jesus said, is within you. It's among you. Yes, Jesus was among them, but it's also right now the kingdom of God is that which rules and reigns in the hearts of his people all over the world. He told them, you're going to go and you're going to preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does the kingdom of heaven look like? Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, freely receive, freely give. And then he goes into uh, not taking anything, just seeing what God will do um, in that first mission, missionary journey that they went out, their, their mission trip. So what does it look like when the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. When the authority of God shows up when God is operating in and through his church, the people of God, it means that Satan's kingdom gets kicked in the teeth. That's what it means. It means that Satan's kingdom cannot stand when God's people who are part of his kingdom show up and stand up in boldness in his power and strength. And then he goes on and he says, don't take anything with you. Later, he's going to say in Luke 22, we see, he says, when I sent you out without money, uh, uh, without a money belt or a bag and sandals, um, you did not lack anything, did you? They said, no, nothing. He said, but now whoever has a money belt, take it along. Likewise, also a bag. And whoever has no sword, sell it and buy a coat and buy one. He's saying that first mission trip you went on, that was one thing. Now, this time it's different. And for some reason, he wanted them to go out and see maybe in that initial um, mission to the people around them, see his power and his might. But later, he's going to not not say that as much. So um, he says the same thing to us that he said to them. This is my final thought. And that is 
when you go out, don't go in your own strength. When you step out, be prayed up. And well, I, I mean, I'm not going out to do a big mission trip right now. I'm not sure what you're talking about. What that? Okay. Are you living life? <laughs> Are there people around you who don't know Jesus? Are there people around you who need prayer? All of us have a mission field. And although we may see ourselves as very ordinary, not very extraordinary, God chooses to do extraordinary things through very ordinary people who are simply willing to say yes, who are willing to say, Lord, I trust you. I'm going to get out of the way. Just like he told the disciples, look, you show up and I'll do the rest. He tells us, show up, be prayed up. Don't think that you can do life without the power of God. And we get our power in the prayer closet, in the word. That's where we get our strength because we yield to him. We get inspired by him. We hear from him. And then we have the strength that we need. So you show up, prayed up, and God does the rest, just like he did in the disciples and the apostles. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand. <laughs> Let's pray. And Lord, we thank you for always showing up. Lord, um, you know where each of us is right now, this morning, in our lives, in our prayer life. And just like Levi, who is now called Matthew, chose to always refer to himself as Matthew. Lord, I pray for each one of us this morning that we would not look with regret and do nothing and beat ourselves up for the past and missing opportunities and not being prayer warriors. But instead, Lord, right now, we would start this moment today and know that your mercies are new every morning. And that we would say, I'm going to pray more. I'm going to devote a time to pray. To intercede for the people and the situation in the world around me. And I'm going, Lord, to yield to you. I don't want to get to the end of my life and look back and say, I wish that I had not gotten in God's way. I wish that I had let him do what he wanted to do in me and through me. Lord, our prayer today is that we would not be sidetracked with regret, but instead we would say today is the day of salvation. Your mercies are new every morning. Your mercies are new right now. So Lord, encourage your church. Thank you for this fellowship of believers. Thank you for their love for you, Lord Jesus, their love for your word. Keep us all till we meet again. Through Jesus, we pray. Amen.